Walter, you're eating bananas, I'm eating grapes. Hi, uh, my name is Inay Prakash and I'm a cinema programmer at Maisel's Documentary Center, uh, which is a small, uh, about 50 seat cinema in Harlem. Uh, we also have an education program and we are currently running films virtually. Uh, we have the film Dope is Death playing right now online. Um, it'll also be, it'll kick off our sidewalk cinema for the summer on Friday night. Um, so feel free to come by at sunset. And I'm very excited right now uh, to introduce Mia Donovan, uh, the filmmaker, and Cleo Silvers and Walter Boss, who appear in the film. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, let me just start uh, by asking you, so this film, uh, for those who haven't watched yet, tells the history of the um, Lincoln Detox Center um, and the takeover that led to the establishment of the People's uh, Detox Program there. Uh, can you talk about how you uh, learned about this history and your way into the story, Mia? Sure. Um, thanks again for having bringing us together for this. Um, I learned about the history through my acupuncturist in Montreal named Mario Wexu, who uh, eventually, who ended up giving scholarships to Walter Bosque, Dr. Matulu Shakur, Richard Delaney, Richard Bird, so four members of different activist groups to learn acupuncture in Montreal and bring it back to the South Bronx to help with, uh, to treat um, withdrawal symptoms from heroin and secondary symptoms associated with drugs. So I was going to get acupuncture and I saw this amazing poster on the wall, basically in Mario's house, my acupuncturist's house that said, we will fight heroin and methadone by any means necessary, educate the people. And there was these like black hands with acupuncture needles. And it was just this incredible poster that had um, illustrations like of this, like warning about the CIA and ph pharmaceutical companies. So I, it started with me asking Mario about this poster and then him telling me about this, his role in this history. And then I started writing Dr. Mitchell Shakur, who's incarcerated in 2013 and learning about it from talking to everybody. Right, and uh, we'll get more into it, but I'll mention you dedicate the film um, to Dr. Matulu Shakur, who's uh, still in prison, a political prisoner, um, who's been diagnosed with cancer and didn't, has been denied uh, compassionate leave multiple times. Um, Walter, can I ask you now how you, um, how you got involved? Um, Sure. So I was in nursing school in 1970, and um, I ran into an old friend, Mickey Melendez, who actually was the founder of the Young Lords organization. And so we started, I hadn't seen, we, we go back, he's my oldest friend, by the way, and we go back to the 60s when we're trying to do cultural stuff in the community around Latin music. So we met in the 60s. So then the Vietnam War got in the way. He had created a, a fraternity because we were all thinking of going to college, not going to war. But some of us got drafted and went to war and some of us went to college. So uh, in 1970, during my summer break from nursing school, I ran into Mickey and he tells me that they had just taken over the Lincoln Detox, uh, Lincoln Hospital Nurses Residence. And when I told him I was in nursing school, he immediately recruited me to volunteer for the summer. So of course, the next day I showed up at the detox program as a volunteer and seven and a half years later, I was still there. But by then I was an acupuncturist. So I don't know how much you want to hear about seven and a half years of struggle, but that's how it started. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and then Cleo, you, uh, can you talk about how you got involved in the struggle? I know you, you worked at the hospital and you were also a member of the Black Panther Party prior to the takeover, right? Uh, yes. Uh, if I remember correctly, I was both in the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords. Um, and I'm so sorry that Panama Alba is not here, uh, our first uh, patient. It happened because I was in the Black Panther Party. I was selling newspapers on a corner uh, across the street from Lincoln Hospital, uh, 
And I, these two drug addicts were catcalling me. And I was like, you know, one of them was like, looked like a little baby. He was 15, but he looked like he was 12. And he was on the corner nodding out. So I started, uh, the other one was like 27, was, it was quite a bit older than me. And uh, I started talking to them, you know, I'm selling the newspaper. They were interrupting my paper sales, by, by the way, which I was very good at selling newspapers. And I finally said to them, you know, you guys are really destroying yourselves and you're letting the system destroy you. Um, and uh, you should be thinking about getting off of those drugs. I also showed them on the corner, a catty corner to where we, where we were, a police car that was selling heroin out of the police car to uh, drug dealers in the community. So at this time, I was a, a worker. I was a community mental health worker at Lincoln Hospital. And we had been discussing as mental health workers the need to have a non-chemical um, non drug detoxification program, which had, the idea had come up a year before that this was an absolute need in the community, but we were busy fighting uh, the, the leadership of the mental health services at that time. So I gave Panama and Butch my, my telephone number and I said to them, whenever you are ready to get off with drugs, come over, call me and we'll help you. And just so happened that simultaneously with, the dis with our decision to take over the nurse's residence, where we were gonna be and how we were going to do it. And with the support of the Young Lords, the Black Panthers and members of the community, another group called the, Brown, the Black and Brown Cadre, which was high school students we had recruited to get involved. Um, we made the decision that in two days after we had detoxed Panama and Butch, that we would then go in and establish the program. And we had pretty, a pretty good idea of what kind of program we wanted it to be. We knew that we did not want to use a method on maintenance because that was a problem. And that was a continuation of, of uh, addiction for people in the community. We knew that we wanted, we needed uh, a more progressive uh, point of view in terms of delivery of care to uh, people who were addicted to heroin. And we definitely knew we wanted to have political education as a part of the programming. So that's how it got started. And I guess it was, what was it a week after we got started, Walter, that you came in? Yeah, I, I came that summer. You, you, uh, the, you guys took over in November and I came that summer on my break from school. So. We, we didn't, I mean, we weren't sure like who we were going to have uh, in the leadership. Um, but Zaid Shakur, who was my mentor, uh, and his brother Lumumba were in the leadership of the Black Panther Party. And of course, I newly recruited into the Black Panther Party. And they said to me, uh, we would like for you to uh, hire our brother, Matulu. And he's, you know, he's really charismatic and he's wonderful and he would make a great um, director, executive director of the program. So that's exactly what I did. I did as I was asked to do by Zaid and Lumumba Shakur, I hired their brother Matulu. And that's how Matulu Shakur, and it was weeks after, I, I, know, I know Panama is better at all the details, but it was weeks after the program had started. So Matulu came in and we established him. We were all very, very busy and no one else had the time uh, to really run the program. So we gave that responsibility to Matulu and he did an excellent job. He was a charismatic. He was uh, a little bit intimidating. The management of the hospital um, leadership on, on a citywide basis was a little intimidated. He did most of the negotiations about the funding for the program, all that, and he led the direction for the use of acupuncture as a, um, as a method of uh, helping people detox 
from the use of heroin and from their addiction to heroin. And that's, that's how we got started. That was the beginning. Can I ask um, what the takeover was like, what the spirit was like in the hospital and what was happening logistically? You, in the film, you refute the claim that there was an, any interruption of care to patients. Absolutely. Um, there was a second, I'm not even sure whether it was the second or the third takeover of Lincoln Hospital, uh, but never. Uh, the Young Lords uh, led the, the last takeover. I believe it was the last, to, no, the second takeover. And that there was never at all because we didn't just run into places and take over things, or we didn't just decide that things were needed to happen. We took time uh, and, and um, right. How do you do that? We, included, we organized the community. We talked to people in the neighborhood. We uh, had a, what is called a um, Think Lincoln Committee complaint table that we set up for 24 hours a day in the emergency room. And at that time, Lincoln Hospital was known as the butcher shop because the conditions were so horrendous. And it, people would wait for 72 hours on, on a weekend to get seen in the, in the hospital. Um, so, it wasn't something that we just decided, you know, we ran in there and we're young people, we decided we need to have this. We put, we, it took us almost a year itself to first of all, gain the support of the people in the community. We gained the support of the workers in the hospital. There was a, a group called the Lincoln Collective, which was a group, group of doctors who supported us as well. And all of this, we had to pull together and get everybody working in unison in order for this to occur. How do you think that we could take over a hospital and not have any interruption in service if we didn't have the support of the doctors and the workers and everybody that, that the administ well, not an administration, they didn't like it at all. Uh, but we had we had doctors, we had nurses, we had all the, the different kinds of staff that were there to give us as much support as they possibly could under the, under the circumstances. So there was never any interruption in services. Mia, there are so many, um, you know, ways you could have entered this story after you learned about it. Um, from your acupuncturist, how did you uh, how did you begin the process of researching and um, deciding who to talk to? Yeah, well, until uh, for the first several years, I was um, meeting with visiting Dr. Matula Shakur, and I he was uh, supposed to be released in 2016, and I had was planning to film him coming out and reuniting with Mario and continuing his work. So it was a much different. Um, original idea, like kind of um, much more like an intimate portrait of him get, getting out. And then when he wasn't released, um, I started to, you know, I was, I was emotionally connected to the cause more and I just needed to, I wanted to try and find a way to tell the story and to understand, to position Matulu as a, his political, you know, imprisonment and to give context. So I started to reach out to Walter Bosque. Matulu facilitated all the meetings with people. So um, Walter was one of the first people I connected with from uh, the original Lincoln Detox Collective and started sh shooting with him. It just like started going back and forth to New York to shoot research interviews. And then um, the challenge was trying to make a film about this movement with Matulu at the heart of the film, but without having access to him because all our all our requests to interview him on camera were denied. So it was very challenging. Like we couldn't even do a telephone interview with him. So, um, and I really wanted to try and contextualize the period, like the, con the political context of the time. So archival, it, like archives became really, really important which is also, which is very, very complicated to work with, with licensing and tracking down like who owns these archives and stuff. But um, so yeah, it was just, that's, that's, that's sort of how it, how it kind of evolved. Can, can, can I just say that, um, I mean, if we don't learn anything else from tonight, 
the thing that people should know is that Matulu Shakur is absolutely innocent and has been incarcerated for all these years for something he never had anything to do with. He was not anywhere close to where this incident took place. And he's in there on a RICO charge uh, and had and had, was accused of leading this um, this Brinks robbery, but he was nowhere to nowhere near there. So that he actually should not be in prison, and uh, that the struggle to uh, to to gain his release should be at the top of of the work that we're doing at this time. Yeah, thank you, thank you for saying that, um, Cleo. Uh, Walter, can I ask about your um, experience uh, with Matulu and, you know, that summer uh, you got there, how your politics began to form and merge with this very, uh, you know, real practice? Uh, so let me give you a little history. We took over the, the Young Lords with the help of the Black Panthers and community and Atrum, which Cleo was part of, uh, took over the nurses' residence of Lincoln Hospital. They didn't, they didn't take the proper hospital. That's why we didn't interfere with any medical patient relations. Uh, it was the nurse's residence, which was attached to Lincoln Hospital. And that building had been like a, abandoned. On the second floor, we had some, uh, they had some social workers. So we occupied, from my understanding, talking to Mickey and Felipe, that you'll see on the film, how he explains it. They took over the building and they secured it within minutes. And then we negotiated with the administration for the detox program. Uh, Matulu didn't come on staff until 1971, 72. So we had already, as the Young Lords, we had already created a political action group. We had political prisoners of fun. We were defending Carlos Feliciano, who was a Puerto Rican uh, nationalist who had been incarcerated with Don Pedro Arvizu Campos during the uh, rebellion in Puerto Rico in, in the 50s. And so we started working with the Puerto Rican nationalist independence movement of Puerto Rico. And that's how we started doing our politics. And we shared that information and history with the clients that we were detoxing. In the beginning, in 1970, we were using a 10-day detox, methadone detox cycle. So prior to that, all we had was methanol maintenance. So if you got in trouble with the law, you had the option of going to jail or going on methanol maintenance. And that's exactly what we didn't want. We didn't want methanol maintenance because we knew that methanol maintenance was like liquid handcuffs. Once you got on methanol maintenance, you would be on it forever. And you wouldn't be able to travel because they weren't, they weren't going to give you 10 bottles of methadone if you want to go see your grandmother in Puerto Rico or in Jamaica. So we wanted people off of methadone. So we started the methadone detox. By 1971, we realized that we were just helping introduce methadone to the community. And then we had an epidemic with methadone. People were overdosing because methadone is a synthetic opioid. Actually, methadone was the first opioid epidemic we had in this country. Now we're all familiar with the opioid epidemic that we have at, at the present time. But people were, de uh, were overdosing with methadone. And the problem with methadone and heroin was that when you overdosed on heroin, you could go, that you would go to an emergency room that would give you a shot of Narcan and send you home. Now we have Narcan kits for people who are addicted and people are walking around with their kits. If anybody overdoses, you just give them a shot of the, method, of the Narcan kit. But back then in the 70s, when you overdose on methadone because it was a synthetic drug, you would get the Narcan in the emergency room, but when you go home, it would wear off and you overdose again while you were sleeping. So a lot of people overdosed and died. So that became a real epidemic problem in the community and we definitely were looking for an alternative. And we found the alternative because we were following the socialist movements around the world in particular in the People's Republic, Republic of China. So we were watching uh, you know, videos and reading books about what they were doing in the People's Republic of China with traditional Chinese medicine. And so that gave us a, a, an idea of how we could use it in the program. 
So Matula and I, we went to California and started visiting some acupuncture clinics. They weren't detox programs. They were just regular acupuncturists with their practices. And we started watching how they did it. And then we got involved with some acupuncturists in New York. And we started, you know, we hired them on and we started, we became their assistant. We became their uh, interpreters because here we are detoxing people from heroin who inject heroin into their veins. And now we got to convince them that we're going to put needles in their body. They're not going to get high, but they're going to withdraw from the drug. So it was a challenge, but we did it. And then, of course, we gave them political education. So we talked about the Boxer Rebellion. We talked about the opium wars. And so then we made it clear to them that opium in China back in the 1700s is the methadone in the United States in the 1970s. And so once we got people convinced and educated on what history was, we liberated minds and hearts, and people not only got off of drugs, but they joined the movement. And that's when we became a threat to the establishment, because now we were getting people off of drugs and they were becoming activists in the community and they were working and protesting and, and you know, it became a problem for the city to, to handle us. Thanks for that and, and for clarifying the timeline. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. But in the meantime, can I ask you, Cleo, to say a little bit more about the political education? classes, how you structured those, um, and, and what you were teaching and why? Well, um, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, well, to begin with, it is clear that the struggle for equality in, in justice, and particularly the struggle for equality in resources, in, in the access to resources, is a universal question and in particularly in the United States, that the, uh, the few, the tiny number of people in society that, that own and control the resources uh, have not been willing to share the resources of society with the, with the majority of the people. So what's ha what happens in, in our society is that the uh, poor get seemingly poorer, have fewer times avail availability and ac fewer access uh, to things like quality health care, uh, things like even getting going to a program to um, get off of heroin. Those things exist in the society and there's no way you can turn your head from that. Uh, and the need to change that is the bottom line, has always been the bottom line. Um, all right. I mean, beginning from, of course, slavery, where that initiated the, the differences between uh, human beings and the society. It has been that the human beings who are not slaves are the ones that gain access to the resources that have decent food, decent, decent clothing, a decent place to live, which are the basics that people need. Um, and that they were not they were not given to or made available to the people because of the color of their skin, and uh, as society has has uh, developed, then it became the basis on the, beyond just the basis of the color of your skin, but uh, if you are an immigrant, you come into the country and you are not recognized as a, a rich white male, then you don't get anything. And whatever resources are available are not just made, made available to you. Um, as an African American growing up in the United States, I was uh, always aware that that was the way it was. And uh, the way I was taught uh, when I grew up is that in order to get half of what you deserve in the society, you have to be 100% better than at everything than the people who have access to those things. That's what the civil rights movement is all about. That's what the struggle of Martin Luther King and the, and the 
one of the reasons that we believe that one of the reasons that Martin Luther King was assassinated was because one of the last calls that he made was for a continual annual income for all people that did not have access to funds. And if you go back and look into uh, what his demands were, you will find that. The other piece uh, is that uh, African Americans and people of color in the United States have been victims of a policing and incarceration system that focused on them and not on the crimes necessarily, but the purpose was to just incarcerate and kill black people. And as you know, that still exists. So uh, the, the question is how do you get people to understand what is happening, what their conditions are? And that was the, that was the purpose of our political education is to just get people to understand what is really going on in society in clear and concrete terms. So that we had books, we, we had several books of where there's an analysis in the books of, you know, what is going on in society, which we ask people to read, and then we discuss them in groups. Uh, and people started to learn about what exactly is going on in society. Why and why it is that we would be calling for free quality health care for all, preventive health care, uh, things that are still at issue today, as a matter of fact. Uh, so political education um, for us was just a way of allowing ourselves to be uh, better educated as to an analysis of the world, uh, the world's conditions and to, uh, to help people who are just in the community, not necessarily educated at the same level that we were, to understand what their conditions are and what they are today, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm sure you have more detailed questions, but that's the key to this whole thing, is that we know, and um, it is so clear, the clarity uh, that opens up is opening up on an everyday basis because of COVID-19, by the way, that really exposed the disparities in the society in every way. Um, that And what we've been talking about. The other thing is that uh, people talk about the Black Panther Party and uh, as a result also talk about um, the Young Lords as you know these uh, maniacs running around with guns. No, we were not. What we were saying was that if you're going to catch us on the street and try to beat us up. We're just not accepting it. We're not going to go away easily. You're gonna to have to deal with people who are willing to stand up and fight for themselves, to stand up and fight back, which was why we had guns on the street. When it was legal to have a gun and the police had a gun, it put you on an equal basis. Although, by the way, our guns did not have ammunition in them. So the purpose was, was to show the community that you could stand up, but you didn't want to just be crazy and, and run out here with guns and uh, try to fight police with all their firepower. That was not the point. The point was to show that you can stand up and, uh, and, and demand to be treated in a, in a decent manner and with dignity on the streets. And I'll be happy to answer any of the- Oh, you know. sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Cleo. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a few more minutes and I wanna ask you, uh, Mia, uh, you mentioned you know the difficulty of accessing archives for this material. This is very much like a people's history um, and you know about opposition to institutions that are often doing the telling of history. Uh, where where did you end up finding uh, the bulk of this material? And um, yeah, I mean, is this is this a history that's well preserved, or, or did you find that the opposite is the case? Um, I think I was surprised at how much at some of the archives we found because I was working with an archival researcher um, who named Edmund Duff, who knows how to navigate all these archives. So he, and he has like a, a relationship with the librarians and and he was would give like every time I would interview somebody I would write down dates or events and then we would just try and locate anything that would support this history anything visual like um 
uh, but right, but we didn't know. And then at the other the other side of it was like he would get some re archives that were interesting, and then I would ask other people about it if they knew who was in it. So it was this kind of parallel process that was part of the research and then part of the storytelling. But um, it took like years, and some of it was personal archives. There's 197 archives altogether. Like, so like that's including photos and everything had to be, you know, like tracked down. And so it was like a huge job. Um, but in some of the amazing archives were like probably B-roll or stuff that wasn't necessarily, that was filmed by, by um, mainstream, like local news, but that had just ne not necessarily been aired. And that was just sort of sitting there. So some of the stuff had been digitalized for the first time. Like the stuff I think with, um, Lumumba Shakur and Dr. Paul Curtis, like there's certain stuff that had really not really been seen much. So um, it was really like part, it was to me like, such an important process just for myself to understand what was going on at that time historically. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of remarkable uh, material in the film. Um, there's an anonymous question from the audience that I think might be a good one to end on. Um, so I'll kind of uh, direct this to all three of you. Um, but uh, they say, thanks to everyone for their contribution. Uh, very enlightening. What are lessons about persistence you took away from your time in the struggle um, that the uprisings of the past year uh, and hopefully you know, ongoing uh, could learn from? And I suppose I'll add to that, um, you know, do you still believe uh, revolution is possible and necessary? Um, or are there other means by which to achieve, um, you know, goals for humanity? I don't know. You want to go first, Walter? Um. All right. Let, let me go first. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we had a, an extended family called the movement. There was an anti-war movement. There was a black liberation movement. There was a Puerto Rican independence movement. So that was our extended family. So that made the movement. It was, it, we weren't alone. We were part of that family. So there was a tremendous movement in America, throughout America. So times have changed. And we were fighting against anti-imperialism and in particular, the Vietnam War. And so the movement was large, but now, 50 years later, we have nine wars that we, our tax money is going to, and we don't have that large movement anymore. And I don't think that we can continue to use the same tactics that are 50 years old and get the same results. So we have to try to use a different tactic, you know, because now we have the internet. We could organize more people on the internet, on the cell phones, and we have to use a little different tactic. I don't think there'll be another uh, People's Republic of China or Republic of Cuba or a, a Russian uh, independence because times have changed. And we're now in this global economy, which has turned into a global war. And so when we have the issues of immigrants and they, they, be, they get vilified, why do we have immigrants? Because there's nine wars going on throughout the world and they are leaving because their society has been demolished. So to vilify immigrants is the wrong thing to do. Why don't we vilify the nine wars and, and the people who are using our tax money to fight those wars and in the process becoming billionaires? Um, my answer uh, is that I don't think that uh, the world uh, with all of the people in society will be able to sustain itself with the same conditions that exist for poor people, for the 99% in society, uh, un unless absolute change takes place. Now, as, in, as a matter of fact, we were calling it revolution then, I call it revolution now. We have to give people the basics of life that they need 
or else the people that have the basics are not going to be able to continue to have them to maintain them because people are not going to have it. They're not going to continue to watch their children dying because they don't have access to quality health care. They're not going to continue to uh, starve to death on the, on the streets and be homeless and that kind of thing. So, and that my belief is that new organizations and new methods of struggle are going to take place as, the, as we develop in society. Um, well, I think what people can learn though from our history 50 years ago is consistency that you never give up. That uh, I don't believe that we can, as I say, we, we can sustain a, a, a place uh, on, the, on the planet as human beings without uh, this necessary struggle. And that uh, I also think that the struggles that are taking place now have to um, unite, people have to unite, and they have to begin to think through in a more organized fashion the way in which they're going to, to struggle. What are the major things that you're going to focus on? Uh, and how do you make the, the connection between the international struggles and the struggles here, for instance, in the United States. How is it that right now working people who have uh, been given access to uh, the vaccine are not fighting to allow people in India and in Africa and around the world, around the third world to still have access that we have at this time. So because if we don't, the, the same, those same, um, uh, viruses that exist over there are going to find their way if it's no more than they're floating through the air back to the United States. So we have a responsibility to organize and to fight to make sure that if we have resources, we have access to those resources, that those resources are dispersed throughout the world where they, where they should be. So Thank you. And, and I guess Mia, has making this film at this time influenced your um, sort of political convictions and ideology and uh, belief in tactics and strategy? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, the whole, this whole process of getting to know Walter, Cleo and everyone and doing the research has definitely like, it's hard to say exactly where every, you know, how, because it was, it's been such a long process, but I think, um, more than ever, the inequities and like white supremacy is in such sharp focus for me, much more than I believe it was before, I think. Um, it's just, it's really, in, I, I come from Canada, so it's a bit, there's, we, with healthcare, it's, it's a whole different thing. Like we don't have to, we don't worry about healthcare in the same way because it, we have universal healthcare and um, but what really inspired me is how these young activists, like how in 1970, they just the, the how they operated in the community, like Cleo was talking about the, the, the complaint table in the hospital, like they were asking the community what they needed and starting from like the people they could they could reach directly. So it was like this type of activism that's just like really um, you know, like kind of um, in reach, like that's like, it's ambitious, but it's also like, let's do what we can, let's like really just do this here, you know, like, and it's just really like, so, so um, for me, inspiring and, you know, hopeful and getting to know Matulu. Matulu is, has this ability to inspire so much hope, even from inside prison, like just this hope of in humanity and people and caring and people taking care of each other. So, you know, the whole process has been amazing. I have um, one well, last thing to say. Uh, uh, Mia, I so much agree with what Mia is saying. And the one thing that I forgot to say is that what the one thing and the one method that we had that's not so much available to young people now is speaking directly to other human beings and making the case in a very direct way and, and explaining 
based on the conditions in which we are all living. And I think that's such an important thing, you know, having Zoom meetings is, it can be effective to a degree, but at another level, it's that touch, that eye to eye, direct, direct contact with people that's so important. And we have to learn that and we have to rebuild that in order to have a, an effective struggle. Thank you for saying that, Cleo. And, um, you know, please come see us face to face, eye to eye on, on Friday on the sidewalk in Harlem where we'll be showing the film live. Um, I'm so uh, grateful to have been able to have this conversation with you all. May I say one more thing? Please, Walter, absolutely. Okay. So what we have to understand that back in the 50, 50 years ago, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords wanted to feed the community. We had the free breakfast programs. We wanted to control the schools. We wanted to control health care. And as a result, because we wanted free health care and we wanted a Medicare for all, but even back then, we were attacked because we were against the establishment, where the establishment wanted to make profits before serving the people. We wanted to serve the people and forget about the profits. Now, maybe that was just a dream, but the fact that they came down on us and wiped out many of us and incarcerated many of us when all we wanted to do was stop the war and feed the poor. Thank you, Walter. And you know that's a good reminder too that um, again, at the heart of this movie, uh, Dr. Matulu Shakur, who remains a political prisoner. Cleo, please feel free to show us your shirt, which you showed me at the beginning. Um, is there, I guess, uh, let me also end by asking, is there a way people can get involved in, in the fight and the struggle to free um, Matulu and other political prisoners? Well, there's a, there's a website that uh, matuluShakur.com, which is updated regularly by his family and friends and uh, support, his support team. And um, whatever up-to-date like call to actions come up will are posted immediately. Right now there's um, there's a petition that you can sign up, you can sign and you can also sign up for newsletters to find out what's going on. So right now I'm not like, there will be some sort of a call to action. I'm not sure in what form, if it's going to be like um, phone calls or like something, um, but there is an urgency and, but it has to be done right because it's just the circumstances. So we're just sort of waiting to see what the lawyer will post. And then there's also the, uh, the Jericho movement, which is a resource for political prisoners. Um, all the, the remaining black liberation political prisoners um, and other political prisoners that people can check out. Thank you. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and that's all for tonight. Uh, again, you can see the film at mazels.org or you can come through uh, on Friday where we'll be showing the film on the sidewalk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.